Should this country of 50 states simply and peacefully break apart? Hey there, thanks for joining me today on this somewhat dreary fall day in beautiful upstate New York, or as I like to refer to it, the People's Republic of New York. A beautiful state, blessed in so many ways with wonderful geography, an ocean, mountains, um, access to lakes, but very corrupted in terms of its political structure. Here in America, we are three weeks out from a very important national election where the American people will decide between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. I'm wondering about something larger. I'm wondering about this propensity of people to think that our solutions come through political mechanisms. And while they are important, political mechanisms are important, it would be naive of us to not acknowledge that our political process has been corrupted. The structure of the United States, which is a beautiful structure of checks and balances, unfortunately is but a shadow of what it was intended to be. And I think it's fair to say that whatever side of the aisle you are on, that the original framers would probably have a heart attack if they could see what the United States has become in terms of its administrative uh, state that it has become. The agencies, the EPA, the FF, FAA, the uh, FCC, the ATF, the FBI, the, e, you know, the list goes on and on. The alphabet soup continues on and on. We have bureaucrats that make laws that are not created through our body, the Congress, and uh, we have a, a lot of really corrupt officials in that process, people that are taking money to stay in power. It's a little bit depressing, but let's not even go into that in any kind of great detail today. Let's talk about the larger elephant in the room, if you will of what is it that is going on here in the United States? Can we say that we have moved into a cold, almost war, warm culture war? It seems to me that identity politics ends in blood. We saw something similar in what was then called the Soviet Union with a leader called Stalin, who murdered millions of his own citizens. We don't hear about it much. We hear about the Holocaust, the six million Jews that were killed in, by Germany, and that's, of course, a horrible thing and should never happen again at all costs. But we don't hear about a communist leader who killed probably double that, if not three times that amount of people, imprisoned people in a gulag system. And a lot of what happened in that process was the demonization of people of means. It, if someone has means, wealth, over you, it is your moral duty to take it from them. They got it basically because they're corrupt. And it's interesting to see in the United States today that if you change class with the word race, we're seeing some of this as well. We're seeing the shutting down of the language. We're seeing the shutting down of expression on college universities. Speakers who um, would be controversial are seen as simply hate speech, shut them down. Change in the language, change the culture, change the laws, change the society. It is your moral imperative, if you see something like racism, to be not simply not racist, but anti-racist. You must work against racism, or you are in fact a racist. The idea of just being live and let live has been decreasing in the United States. 
I've been thinking for some period of time that the United States somehow lost its way, and I can't quite pinpoint it. You know, there's always been issues in the United States. We have had slavery here. We have taken land away from indigenous people. We have subjugated women. But at the same time, there have been some really beautiful things that have happened here in the United States. And people have come here by the millions to enjoy a life of freedom. They have aspired to live a free life. My relatives, all four grandparents that came from other countries in Europe, aspired to do that. Despite its imperfections, it's still a pretty great place to live. But at some point, the process has become totally corrupted by lobbyists that own politicians. And those politicians, in fact, don't end up working for us, the American people. They work for the people putting money in their pocket. And we suffer as a result. So when I think about politicians that will protect my rights or that might potentially take away my rights, that line is becoming increasingly difficult to see. Just as a case in point, when I think about my Second Amendment rights, the protection of my Second Amendment rights, at first glance, you would think, wow, Donald Trump is really great. He's appointed pretty good justices during his time in office. And he has said, your Second Amendment rights are valuable and should be protected. And in fact, a lot of very good organizations that I respect and I'm a member of have endorsed him. But then we have his ATF, his Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms Agency, uh, taking baby steps to ban certain types of weapons, kind of backdoor banning. The honey badger is what I'm speaking about right now. And you can look that up. You can take some time and look exactly, look at what's happening there, this sort of slippery slope of gun confiscation. And we have to stay vigilant. But even a man who I would think, ah, he's been pretty good about this issue, can't hang your hat on his, him or his campaign because inevitably the politicians, even the ones that portray themselves as not being politicians, sell you out. And then, of course, there's the politicians that tell you exactly what they want to do. Take away your guns, as an example, Mr. Joe Biden or Kamala Harris or any of the people that are associated with that party's politics. So here we are again. What do we do? There's a problem with the political system. Where do we go from here? With either one of those characters winning in November, there's going to be some kind of conflict afterwards. Whether the other side doesn't accept the results or whatever, what have you, there's going to be a conflict. And so the question then becomes, what side of the fence are you on and what is your reaction? I would argue that if we're just simply looking to maintain the status quo or to return to what we had pre-2020, I think that we're not really keeping our eye on what is really important because America has changed. Morally, it's changed. It's lost its compass. And I think most people of faith, Jew, Christian, Muslim, even Buddhist would say a society that has lost its moral compass is sort of lost. And I think we're seeing that a little bit. We're seeing actually quite a bit. We're seeing that, that moral, the moral anchor sort of slipping away. And we don't have our why anymore. Why are we a country? Why are we together? Why are there 50 states? Should there be 50 states? Should this country of 50 states simply and peacefully break apart into regions or individual states in the way that the, you know, the Soviet Union did? Before the Soviet Union disappeared, I never really was paying attention to countries like Estonia and Lithuania, Latvia. And after it broke up, those countries, those ethnic enclaves became what they are, the true countries that they were, culturally. And so I ask you the same question. Should the United States be a country of 50 states? Should people in Alabama 
and the values of Alabama rule people in Massachusetts? And likewise, should people in California or New York or Chicago determine what's legal and what's moral in states like Mississippi or Texas or Florida? I think not. I certainly don't advocate for a violent change. I don't think a violent change is necessary. But I think change is necessary. And I think just like a couple would look at each other and say, this marriage isn't working very well. Maybe the citizens of a country could do the same thing. Now, in the 19th century, we had this conversation. It was related to states' rights and slavery and power and many of the things that we're talking about today. The same things. We fought a war and a lot of people died. But I've often wondered, and I've, as an American citizen, have really never been taught. Only the only information I have about this is what I've really studied myself because you know, the victor always determines the story. Um, the story has always been the union needed to be preserved, slavery was bad, needed to end. Well, it was a lot more complex than that. But slavery was, a dividing, was the driving force um, behind all of the states' rights issues and the enforcement of states uh, capturing slaves, fugitive sailors. You can look this up. You can research this. The Confederate states said, we don't want to be a part of that. And whether they were right or wrong, they believed that if they could join a union, they could leave a union. And legal scholars have debated whether or not that's true. And I guess the prevailing thought is that once you're in the union, you can't leave the union. But I think it's time to really reevaluate that. If you're in the union, a state, can you leave a union? Can a place like, again, I'll use the New Hampshire, a sovereign country before there was a United States, leave if they so chose? Could Texas leave? Should they leave? We are in a battle. The obvious issue is racism, but it really boils down to classism. And those two issues intersect very clearly, but it's really about classes. And if I were really to drill down a little bit further, I would say it's really about values. Because the class that you're in, while it intersects with race, does determine your value system in large measure. Where you grow up, who you go to church with, synagogue with, mosque with, determine your values. And when it gets to a point where your values are not surrounding you, or some people with certain values want to take away the rights and privileges and experience of life from others, then maybe it's time to start looking at this, again, not in a violent way, but in a way that realistically says we're adults and we just don't think this is working anymore. We don't. We have moved into a space, a loss of values, a, I, would, I would argue a loss of moral values, into a nihilistic sort of era. We have rejected much of our common moral ground in favor of individualism, post-Christian Christianity. And we are not singing off the same sheet of music anymore. There are people that live on Christopher Street in New York City that are about as different from people living in Jackson, Mississippi, as, you can, as the Martians to the planet Earth. They're just different. And maybe the conversation we need to start having is, it's time for a divorce. Maybe there are, there is some wisdom in a, I've mentioned it before, Grandmaster Jay in the NFAC, even though with his faults, saying, like others before him, it's time for a black nation somewhere. If, there are a, if there's a large contingent of black people that want to leave, maybe they should leave. 
and maybe another contingent of black people that love America and the values that currently exist or have existed can stay and we can build that society together. A society of low taxation or small government and freedom, personal freedom, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as was enshrined in our beloved Declaration of Independence by Mr. Thomas Jefferson. Perhaps it's time to have that conversation. But expect, going through the same old, same old and expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. And it's time to really start taking a deep breath and thinking about some real solutions. I don't want to stand here and thinking about how many bullets I need to purchase, how many more guns I need to purchase to keep myself safe. I, want, I don't want that. I've served in the military. Been there, done that. I don't want conflict in my life or my kid's life or my grandkid's life. I don't want to have to worry about that. But I am worried about that. And you probably are too. I suppose if it comes to it, we have to mobilize. As I said in a previous video, you are the militia and you will be called to defend your rights. Whether it's the freedom of speech, the freedom from search and seizure, freedom from incriminating yourself, and yes, your freedom to bear arms. The final protection that our founding fathers gave to us to ensure that when the government gets out of control, we control the government. The question I have for you is, what is it that we're going to? Where are we going? Is there a new America out there for us? Identity politics ends in blood. Tribalism ends in blood. That is not what we need in this country. But it seems to be where we're headed at some point. If I can shut your speech down, I can shut your ability to have a conversation and form a solution where I respect your humanity and you respect my humanity. We disagree on things, but I respect you as a human. I used to, Voltaire said it, and I've said it a million times, I may not agree with you, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. I believe that was Voltaire. And I truly believe it, but apparently on college campuses in the year 2020, that's no longer an option. And it worries me because those social justice warriors on the campuses today, and really even 10, 20 years ago, are now in the corporate PR offices and decision-making entities of corporations, government, nonprofits. And I don't see where we can have a dialogue when we can't even sit at the table together without throwing things at each other. So I'm asking you to really think about that. I'm asking you to consider what it is that we're working for. I'm gonna ask you also to, if this had value for you, to hit the thumbs up, subscribe, please make a comment or two. I'd really like to hear what you're thinking. Maybe add to the conversation. If there's something that, we, that you wanna talk about, I'm happy to discuss it and bring resources to you for that. So please, at a minimum, give me a thumbs up if it brings value to you. I find it very sad when I drive down the road to see every other house for Biden and every other house for President Trump. And I'm sure that's always happened, but I, it just feels polarized in this country and it's unfortunate that it is. So maybe we can work to getting it a little less polarized by having a conversation with each other, an adult responsible conversation. And if it means working on some things that are just uncomfortable, well, I guess that's really what we need to do because we need to like move to a space that's good where we have freedom and we don't have to worry about people taking things away from us. Whether you're on the left side of the fence and you just don't want somebody taking away your privacy rights as through abortion um, restriction, that's how it's seen. For folks on the right, that's how it's seen. 
that somebody wants to take away a woman's right to privacy. We have to respect that. I understand the moral implications if you think abortion is murder. I understand that. That's a philosophy of when one believes life begins. And for the leftists out there, when you say you're going to take away my AR-15 assault rifle, quote unquote, and you don't know what an assault rifle really is, or you don't recognize that I am not going to hurt you, and that the vast majority of people out there with any kind of handgun or rifle or AR-15 semi-automatic rifle are not going to hurt you, we hear that as a threat. So let's stop threatening each other and work to some real solutions. Thank you so much for joining me here today. It's a little dreary, but being out in nature always reminds me that things come, things go, seasons change, things are born, things die, and then there's rebirth. And maybe that's exactly what we need to remember now more than ever. Till the next time.